poets in, in American history, American culture, have always really been on the front lines of issues that mean something in terms of significant social change, uh, gender, uh, gender um, equity, uh, civil rights work, uh, the suffragette movement, uh, and now the climate crisis. And poets, you know, have this wonderful ability to take great big ideas and distill them down into just a few words. Poets, as James Joyce said uh, a century ago, are really the antennae of the race, the antennae of our race. They see things clearly and they can communicate them very efficiently. So in a minute, we'll hear a poem or two from, from an activist poet from Durham. Uh, we're so lucky to have Bruce later with us, and I'll introduce Bruce in a second. And I'll also introduce our, our three panelists. The way it'll work today is that Bruce will read. If you have questions for Bruce after he reads his short poems, um, certainly ask them. And then we'll move into our three uh, excellent panelists, each of whom will speak for about 15 minutes. And then that will leave us a good 20 minutes or so for what I'm sure will be a rich uh, Q&A session. So uh, let me go ahead and introduce Bruce, uh, a local Durham poet. Uh, Raleigh. Uh, excuse me, Raleigh. Um, still, still triangle though, so generally in the same, same ballpark. Um, Bruce is the director of Bridges Tutoring, an organization educating multicultural students. He has published three full-length books of poetry, including Discovering Mortality, a finalist for the 2006 Brockman Campbell Book Award, and his poems have appeared in Poetry, New York Quarterly, The Humanist, International Poetry Review, New Millennium Writings, uh, Against Agamemnon, War Poems Anthology, and many other magazines. Bruce won the 2010 Left Coast Eisted Fod Poetry Competition and has received a Writer in Residence Fellowship from the Wurlitzer Foundation. Again, we're lucky to have Bruce Bruce with us. I'm going to, head, going to go ahead and introduce uh, our other three panelists right now so as we can create some fluidity without me interrupting uh, later. So, uh, Maria Kingery, Maria, uh, co-founded Southern Energy Management in 2001 with her husband, Bob, and currently serves as the company's CEO with more than 25 years of experience in sales, marketing, and business development. Maria is an entrepreneur with a passion for the creative process. Maria is a frequent speaker on energy and sustainable business topics and serves as board chair for the NC Sustainability Center and is a board member of the NC Sustainable Energy Association, Bull City Forward, and the NC League of Conservation Voters. Wow. <laughs> um, Thank you for being here, Maria. Thank you. Uh, Sally Robertson, my good friend, uh, was a member of the Transition Carver of Chapel Hill Energy Action Group. In 2012, she helped to organize a 3.6 kilowatt community solar project at the Arcadia co-housing community in Carborough. She and others are working to launch other community solar projects this year beginning with the 35 kilowatt project at Pickard's Mountain Eco Institute in Chapel Hill. Mark Bashista is the owner of Home Performance NC, an energy auditing and weatherization company that serves the Triangle. Mark is a certified R-E-S-N-E-T-H-E-R-S -E -E Raider, a Green Raider, a BPI analyst and envelope specialist, an NAHB verifier, as well as a licensed general contractor. So thank you guys, thank you so much for being with us today. We're, we're quite honored to have you here. We look forward to your presentations. So, um, <laughs> without further ado, it's, it's my great pleasure to introduce Bruce, Bruce Slater. Bruce. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I know we have many things on our minds that are going on in the world. So being here is showing that you can still be, have enough energy to put into an event like this. And 
I want to thank Harry for helping to put this together. And also for knowing how to pronounce Eistedfad, which is, <laughs> which is an incredible word. It's a Welsh word. Uh, it's a Welsh American club that sponsors the uh, poetry competition. Uh, what I'm going to be doing is reading one kind of longish poem. It's about two pages. It's a story poem based on a Paiute Indian myth. They, the Paiutes of Utah have a myth which they call legend people that I didn't know about. I'm not a Native American. Until last, two summers ago, uh, my wife and I went out to Utah in Sobrise Canyon and it's at Zion National Park. Have you been there? Yes. It's an amazing sight. It's an amazing sight. So I was inspired to talk about this legend, which is related to the problems that we're having. The legend is, and the myth is very brief. What I did was totally expand and take liberties on it. So please do not identify me with the Paiute Indians who have a very different kind of outlook on life. But we can learn from them. So what I'd like to do is read this legend, people, poem, and then, uh, if there's still time, go to a shorter poem uh, on a more, maybe, optimistic note. Uh, there, if there are any children here in the audience, I think they can identify with this story. Uh, since the children in us, perhaps, uh, there are characters in the legend that are animals and have personalities and interact with the environment. And the more that we're connected to this animal energy and spirit that is in our world, I think the better it will be in the future for people as well. Uh, anything else that you need to know about this? Uh, probably denizens were the residents of Utah. Um, and they lived there from around 1300 up till the present, the present, except that nowadays the population of the Paiutes is very small. They're reduced to very few in number. Legend people. When I give the name Silent City, that is the group of limestone pillars that you see when you overlook the scene at Bryce Canyon. At this particular viewpoint, it's called Silent City. So if you remember that, I think you'll get the picture of what's going on. Sunrise above sawtooth jaws of Silent City spotlights hundreds of ruddy limestone towers, Paiute called legend people, mythic denizens of Utah, renegades of Earth's treaty, they guzzled up beaver rivers, trout streams, and lakes, devoured all the acorns and pine nuts. Herds of elk ranging high plateau couldn't find a puddle or scrap of grassland anywhere. Mountain lion and bear were reduced to fur and bones. Even squirrel and chipmunk scrounged to survive. Cactus stole the jackpot. A ghost after a lightning bolt, coyote sprang up with eyes of glowing berries, took one whiff of legend people, and devised a long-term plan to reform the plundering high rollers totally hooked on loot. Soon the smoggy monopolists hit granite bottom in an empty gorge of do or die debt. Bank accounts drained like dried out creeks, betting only borrowed time. Nevertheless, they double the ante on maximum lines of credit, deal in dust bowls, bet with no limit. When they smuggle remaining marmots to traffic as exotic pets, Coyote Shadows watches them clear cut abiding stands of juniper and bristlecone. Price gouged the firewood. 
yet fail to meet payments default on derivatives. Earth founders, like a wrecked ship, beached on expanding desert of rusted boulders. Unfortunately, Coyote didn't have a bioprinter to raise wildlife from the dead, could not manufacture organs out of stem cells, so the trickster tempted the swaggering gamblers to a feast and wove a spell, glued every foot to the ground with pine sap as bonding as tree roots before they could gobble a melon morsel or drink any blue flax tea. Then the rascal stretched their corrupt clay the way the seafloor lifted to emerald wilderness and white stippled mountains, molded the greed afflicted of silent city into hoodoo columns resembling petrified generals dark faces and torsos sculpted by eons of wind biting gluttonous eyes, rain, pelting stiff, stiff uniforms. Flash floods, frost, and ice storms carve away legend people. As generations of soldiers become lost in battles to conquer time's relentless army, wage windless war against the elements like dissolving sand pillars painted with blood-stained petroglyphic stories. Allied cycles of freeze and thaw combine forces to erode skeletons, stone windows spread open into bridges. Raven glides around with no fear, pecks dead insects off car fenders, snatches fast food from sightseers' hands, laughs in Aspen, helping Coyote's plan unfold. Eagle atop Ponderosa, condor nesting in cliff cleft, want generals to keep turning to stone in Silent City. So Coyote treks a trail with salamander, bobcat, and jackrabbit. They climb a ladder winding to the moon and sun, chant salt songs that conjure thunderous horses, dance like swallows, snake through starry sky. And that is basically the inspiration that got me to write the poem, their, their myth about Silent City and the legend people, which I think has some bearing on what's going on today sort of brings them all together. Um, the other uh, poem, and if there's still time, I'll read another one, uh, is, is a poem about peace, and uh, which I think that if there was more energy directed toward peace, uh, we would have a lot fewer problems uh, dealing with the environment and energy, other energy problems. Um, there's just so much directed in the wrong direction that that I just felt that if we could just focus more on what can be done in terms of harnessing the energy of peace, it will also help the ecological the environment, everything else. Uh, so this is, about, this is about a recruitment center, an arcade, a recruitment center, but not for the military. This is a recruitment center for peace. Welcome to the intelligence gathering center. It's free. Take a long time out and let Turner's sunsets transport you. Explore virtual Cezanne landscapes. Touch glorious angel falls. Breathe essences of nectarine, rosemary, mint. Simulated missions aboard Black Hawk and Apache helicopters are completely outmoded. There aren't any credit attack recoils from assault rifles. Experience multimedia games displaying the music of Thelonious Monk, Gershwin, Ellington, and myriad luminaries. Tap video keys. Watch respectful images of Arabs and Afghans that don't explode. You won't need endless medical treatment for painful injuries. 
Even unmanned predator drones kill people, so we never surveil enemy targets. We want everyone to prosper. Feel your spirit fly when you listen to poems. See their nuances interpreted through cinema. You may produce your own film. Won't suffer PTSD after visiting our kiosks. It's much more fun than getting shot on the roof of a Humvee under sniper fire. Well, I hope that that was more optimistic. Actually, uh, that I want to thank you very much again, and uh, it's time for the panel discussion, which I hope you join us. Do you want us to go in any order? Do you want to begin since you were introduced first? Certainly, I'd be glad to, and I hope you guys don't mind. I was sitting behind a, a table like this, not uh, <clears throat> something I enjoy. So um, thank you. That was a beautiful poem. This is odd. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Okay. And I apologize. I've been at a conference all week, and so my um, I'm losing my voice a little bit. So um, not a very good thing for a speaker to have happen. But at any rate, um, I'm honored to be here with you guys today. I first of all want to acknowledge and thank you all for for taking time out to to be here to to explore these issues. Um, I think it's greatly important that we as individuals um, work and, and fully uh, try to do things that for, to move forward in the ways that we believe that we can. And I can assure you that um, I, even you know, 12 years we've been running our business and some days I wonder if we really made a difference and then it's often not until you take the time to come and, and be with folks like yourselves that all of a sudden have, have a chance to think about it and all the things that we have accomplished. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that because I think it's really a couple of things that I'd like you guys to take away today. Number one, when we started our business in 2001, everybody thought we were nuts. We were here as crazy canaries and they were going to start a solar business. Good luck with that. Um, and, and here we are, 12 years later, there are now hundreds of solar companies in our state. Um, I've named four or five, I, and I should have done the exact count, of um, companies related to solar that have, that have come from our former team members. And I'm extremely proud of that. I mean, that to me is success, right? I mean, we're still working 80 hour weeks, you know, and I'm not sure that that's ever been, I don't know that we would stop it if we could, but um, it, it's been really hard work, but over the, the last 12 years, um, we've we've been successful, and it's been because of folks like you as well. So I want to start there. Um, Southern Energy Management. We started in 2001, and we there was no market for solar. North Carolina. There's a couple of um, key takeaways. The policy is the key driver for market development in the solar industry. So I know there's a sheet of paper over there about what you can do to help support clean energy and sustainable energy in the state of North Carolina. Speaking to your legislators and letting them know that um, you do support clean energy, and I would mean, probably be in the room if you didn't do that on a very regular basis, um, is, is really important, and asking your friends to do the same thing. Because policy, the very little opportunity that we had in 2001 was because North Carolina has had for many, many years a 35% state tax credit on solar projects. So even when we call it the solar, um, I refer to our business as the solar coaster, um, because it's like up and down, up and down. And, and then the 80s, the Carter administration really had some really strong policies, and lots and lots of solar companies were born. And then when the Reagan administration took over, they literally removed the solar panels from the roof of the White House and destroyed the, the, the entire solar industry, crashed pretty much overnight. Um, I said, you know, I was fond of talking about we had a solar hangover for many, many years because of that. But 
we also learn a lot of important lessons. I happen to be a person that believes that we, many times it is through our challenges that we learn the greatest lessons that are out there for us. And so the challenges that the solar industry faced, um, we have now much more knowledge and we have an opportunity to do it much better than we did then. Um, North Carolina, one of the laws right now that is under um, attack is our Renewable Energy Portfolio Standard. How many of you guys have heard of that? Okay, so you guys know all about that. Sorry, so I'm preaching to the choir, I know. Um, but it's, it's really dreadfully, dreadfully important that we don't send a market signal that, and I'm an entrepreneur, right? So I choose to do, I believe in the power of business to do social and, and environmental good. I don't believe those two things have to be so have to be mutually exclusive. I happen to our company is a B Corporation. So if you're not familiar, is anybody familiar with B Corporation? Excellent, excellent. I, if you're not familiar with B Corporation, I encourage you to take a look um, on the internet, bcorporation.net. There are now over 700 companies across the not only the United States but also internationally that we do a um, a voluntary assessment to become certified as a sustainable business. And you can go on there, you can look at, at our score. Southern Energy Management um, was honored last year to be honored best for the world in the overall category. This year, um, we, we got best overall for um, for the environmental category, and that puts us in the top 10% of all B Corps. And, and that's something that we work toward, and, and that everybody in our company knows that this is, this is what we stand for. So that's an important aspect too. This is not just about how are we going to make the next quick buck. And however, market forces do and drive this country. I mean, that's you know the free market, and, and that's something that everybody can agree on. Both sides of the aisle agree on this: that we need more market competition. We need more. The market should drive these solutions. We know that many studies have been done, and, and or if you're not familiar with the North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association, I encourage you to take a look at that organization, because on there, there's lots of reports that, that they've commissioned studies. We know that solar, for example, is now competitive with building a new nuclear plant. All things being equal, we can build solar and deploy solar cheaper than we can build a nuclear power plant. A couple of things people don't talk about. Oh, well, solar is expensive. You know, how many people think solar is expensive? <laughs> right. So, so we talk about important things to remember about solar. Once you, once solar is installed, there's no fuel costs. There's zero fuel costs. So the the upfront costs, just like many things. I mean, it's an investment. The upfront costs are a little bit more, but then. You have you actually have a payback. You know, people. What's your payback on your electric bill? You don't have a payback, right? You just pay for it, pay for it, pay for it. So there are now the market is creating solutions. We have many more financing options available now than we did. I mean, 12 years ago, when some people came to us and said, "I'd like to invest in solar for my home," we'd say, "No, you know, maybe do solar thermal, which heats water." do that because that makes financial sense. If you have a family that, you know, you use a lot of hot water or for some reason you have a lot of hot water usage, don't do PV because it's not cost effective. We don't say that anymore because the price of solar has come down about 80% since we started our business. That's factor one. Factor two is that there are now, um, there are now more financing options because the market is responding. So. One of the things that we can do now is we can put together financing packages that basically are a very small investment. I think one of the last ones, the promotions that we ran said $83 a month. You know, if you can afford $83 a month, then you can you can afford to put solar on your home. I mean, that's out of the reach of, of a lot of people, but it's not out of the reach of everybody. Um, so at our company, we're working, we have a two-part mission, and we're working on both of these really hard every day. Number one, we want to improve and transform the way people make and use energy. The way that we make and use energy now, we have this giant, you know, base load power plants and then we distribute energy out from a central source. 
Intuitively, it doesn't make any sense to me. It never has. Distributed energy and high energy consumed closer to where it's being produced seems to be the natural, much more in line with the natural order of things. Um, so that's one of the things. And then the other piece is we want to transform the way business is done. We want to build a sustainable business that supports our people and that supports our community. So uh, that's why I'm here today. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Thanks, Maria. Um, I'm going to talk about community solar, um, which is another way that solar can be affordable. Um, I live at the Arcadia co-housing community in Harborough, and last year we put together a community solar project, which is basically a way for people to team up with an organization that has a roof or some other property that's appropriate for solar and create a whole bunch more solar than they could do individually on their own. Um, the Arcadia is run by a homeowners association, which is not a nonprofit. Um, or, or that's not what I'm to do it back to that later. It's, um, it's a uh, profit making organization, but they're not profit making, but it's not qualified as a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, it does pay taxes, but it pays this much taxes. So since solar has these incredible, at the moment, tax credits associated with it, 30% uh, of the cost of a solar system that you put up can be taken as a federal tax credit, 35% as a state tax credit. So basically, that's 65% of the price of what you put up, you're going to get back on your taxes. But Arcadia could not take advantage of that, and the people there were well-meaning, but not well-meaning uh, enough to uh, want to throw away that 65 percent. So they just never did find a way to put solar panels on their townhouse roof until uh, last year we started hearing about this community solar model, and nine of the households decided to get together, households that did have some tax bill, and form a limited liability company, an LLC, um, so that the LLC purchased the panels, installed the panels, and each of the members of the LLC will take the tax credits in proportion to how much they put into the project. So some people, we sort of divided the total cost of the system into 20 shares, and uh, people took one or more of those shares depending on what their tax situation was. We came up with a formula, we figured out, you, know, you look at your tax bill, you figure out how much you can um, afford to put into that system and still take advantage of 100% of the tax credits. Uh, and so people put in anywhere from $1,300 to, that was one share, to five times that. So some people put in just one, bought one share, some people bought five shares, and all together we were able to uh, buy the system, get it installed, uh, I just did my taxes, so I was able to, you know, work out my taxes and come down to that tax uh, tax due amount, and then subtract six hundred seventy-seven dollars from that for my two shares. So this is a way that we can get together. We can. It's, you don't have to donate money that you're never going to see again. You put money into a project, and you get it back. In our case, we're estimating it will take about seven years to to earn our money back at which point we'll donate the system to Arcadia and it will continue to produce solar power for probably another 30 or 35 years. So we've taken some money that was just sitting around making, what, 1% in a CD, put it into something much better, um, get it back in seven years, and it goes on giving solar energy for a long time after that. And another thing is, I spent that $677 on solar energy. Otherwise, I would have given it to Washington to do whatever I wanted to do with. Um, so, so we're figuring, we put up 3.6 kilowatts. Uh, we figure we'll get our money back in seven years. There was another project that was installed in Carborough last year. On the, some of you may have seen on the roof of the Carborough Farmers Market. So 
for solar panels went up. That was another LLC. It was a four member, four members of the community who got together and did exactly the same thing. And at the end of their um, cycle, they will donate the panels to the town of Harbor. So this has another event. They're estimating they'll get their money back in six years because of one additional element, which is that the town of Carborough is um, a nonprofit, and when they donate the system at the end, the uh, members of the LLC will get a charitable, a deduction for a charitable contribution. So that's what enables them to make their money back a little faster than we will. So some of us who did this got really excited about it and had grandiose visions of these things just sprouting up like mushrooms all over the state. And so we put together this, um, well, it sort of sounds like an organization, North Carolina Community Solar, but it's really so far just four or five of us that really are passionate enough about it that we want to talk about the model and uh, help people set it up in other places. Um, when I'm done, I'll pass out this flyer about a workshop that we're um, holding next Saturday a week from today at Pickard's Mountain Eco Institute, um, uh, which Sharon mentioned when he introduced me. Um, we are definitely going to do one more project, at least this year, at Pickard's. Um, I think Harry said 35. I had told him 35, and we're now thinking we can fit 40 kilowatts on this huge south basin barn roof. So the workshop next week is going to be sort of a twofold purpose. One is to talk specifically about that project and hopefully get some people interested in being members of that LLC uh, and making it, that project happen, but also to just keep talking about them, this model that I am today and hopefully inspire other people to do this in other places. Any, really what you need is a few people who have a little bit of disposable cash and some sort of tax bill, um, some organization, preferably, uh, well, individual or organization, but preferably a nonprofit organization, for the reason that I mentioned before, um, that has properties with good solar exposure. Um, and then the other thing you need is somebody to bottom line the project. We found that um, we had a lot of good expertise at Arcadia, but, and I had no expertise whatsoever on my part, but I had the uh, obsessiveness to put into managing the project. So you really need somebody to uh, make sure that none of the details fall through the cracks. Um, but if you have, if you're a member of a church or synagogue or community organization, or if you can team up with a social service agencies, any kind of a nonprofit that has uh, property, um, it would be a good candidate for one of these projects. Um, if you don't have somebody who uh, is obsessive as I am and is willing to put in that amount of time, uh, it's really not as hard as it sounds, but it, is, it does require some tenacity. If you don't have somebody like that, maybe if you're teaming up with a nonprofit that has staff, maybe a staff person could take on some of those jobs. There's also an organization in Boone called the Appalachian Institute for Renewable Energy that has probably more experience than anybody in the state with this model, and they've fostered a lot of them. They will, for a percentage of the cost of the system, they will uh, manage it for you. So a lot of the stuff that I had to do and the rest of the LLC members had to do, they will do it for you and make it a lot smoother. Um, they, I think, now are only working with slightly larger systems. I think they told me 20 kilowatts or more. So it might not be an option for a small system. But also, those of us who did these two projects in Carborough and will be doing this Pickers Mountain project, we're building up a body of knowledge about it and we're hoping to uh, make a website that will have information on there that anybody could use to do a similar project. And certainly I'm available to answer any questions that I, can, that I have the answers to or guide people in the right direction. So, for now, this is the best model that I've seen and my friends have seen for, for doing solar projects in North Carolina. Um, there are much better models elsewhere where, you know, states that do not have the restrictive legislation, there are companies now that are putting solar panels on people's roofs for free. Um, but in North Carolina that's not legal because we have a restriction on third party sales, but otherwise the only people you can buy energy from are the utilities. Nobody else can sell you energy. 
Um, so if we can get rid of that, that would be great. And we got all sorts of other options, but till now, till now that's, this seems to be the best. However, the solar credits are under attack uh, at the state level, and if those go away, then the model is a lot less attractive. So that's why we're trying to push this this year, strike while the iron is hot, um, because once you get the system installed, that even though, even though the state tax credit is taking over five years, once you get the system installed, you've got that tax credit. They're not going to take it away from you. But if they do take away the tax credit for next year, then, then there might not be another opportunity to do this kind of thing. So anyway, I'm very excited about having done this little bit and hopefully be able to do some more myself and inspire others to do so. So thanks for letting me talk. And I'm, I'm going to pass these flyers around in any questions afterwards and happy to answer. just 
radiates off all those walls in the house. So it's really important to seal up all those holes before you add insulation. You just certainly don't want to call an insulation company and just have them blow insulation in your attic. You're missing out on probably 75% of the benefit from that added, added insulation. Code now in our climate is R38, which for fiberglass is usually around 13 inches. Cellulose is 10 or 11, so you can see how much you have in your attic. Um, the benefit from added insulation goes down dramatically as you increase it. So if you have almost none, there's a huge benefit from adding more. If you have R19 or R25, the benefit isn't so much from going up to R38. You see people trying to sell you R50 all the time, but there's almost no model savings from going from R38 to 50 in our climate. And I just want to stress, sealing all those holes is the biggest thing you can do. Um, in your crawl space, um, I should have started with this. Before you start sealing up your house, you want to be sure there's not health and safety problems. Like I go in a lot of crawl spaces where there's water leaks and sewer leaks and it's just a horrible one in there. I went in one recently that every single piece of insulation was on the ground and it had been on the ground so long it was flat and there was um, dead possums and all kinds of crazy stuff and you know it's one reason just to take a peek down there every now and then you never know what you're going to find. But, um, so same with the crawl space, um, all sealing all the holes, but before you do that, you want a good vapor barrier on your crawl space, because moisture in our climate is one of the biggest things that damage houses, and you, uh, you uh, may feel uncomfortable in your house unless you have your temperature at 68 or 70, which is crazy cold. Um, a good recommend recommended setting is 78. So if you if you feel like you're going to have to turn it down that low to be comfortable, you know, it could be just the way you are. But a lot of it is with the high moisture in the house. It makes you feel clammy and that you have to turn down, keep turning down the temperature to be more comfortable in your home. And so by dealing with the moisture, making sure gutters take water away from the foundation and a good vapor barrier and no water leaks and no foundation vents that are even with dirt. You know, you don't want water just pouring in there. Um, that can help you feel more comfortable at a higher temperature. And one of the absolute biggest things you can do, I do a lot of energy modeling, and just changing your temperature a few degrees has almost more benefit than spending thousands on weatherization work. And I, I don't want to say you shouldn't do the weatherization work, but you know, the lower you can turn your temperature um, in the winter, the better. Like 68 is a good temperature. We we keep our house kind of cold at 64 or 5. But and then you find people that I find people that have uninsulated, horribly leaky homes, and because they keep their temperature low, they have really low bills. And so if that um, adjusting your temperature just has a huge impact. And one of the things you might see advertised about changing your temperature is programmable thermostats. There's a lot of new ones that are all digital and hooked to your cell phone and um, all kinds of smart devices to change your temperature. Um, you just need to be very careful you don't have a heat pump when you do that, um, unless you have what's called an outdoor temperature sensor. So if you don't have gas for heat, you probably have a heat pump. And if you move your temperature around, like at night you turn it down five degrees, and in the morning you turn it up five degrees, that's probably costing you more money than it's saving by moving that temperature. Because as you move it up that many degrees, when the house can't reach that temperature quick enough, it kicks on the heat strips, which is like heating your house with a hair dryer. And um, it's twice as expensive as when it's running as a heat pump. So what the outdoor temperature sensor does is when it's low enough, I mean warm enough outside, like usually they're set at 35 or 40, it just completely locks up the heat strips so you can move it up 20 degrees and it won't let them come on. Um, but it, it, it's code now, building code, that any heat pump newly installed, if your contractor's getting permits, 
that's supposed to be part of the job. So, so they can be added also to the old, um, any old, older systems. And when you replace your furnaces, try to go with a 90 or 95 percent model. Um, I get tons of questions about, you know, what should I go with? And you know, they're all kind of expensive, but one of the best things if you have gas um, is a dual fuel heat pump. And that saves almost as much energy as geothermal in some houses in the energy model. So what the dual fuel is, it's like a heat pump, and then when it gets really cold, instead of using the heat strips that I talked about, it uses the gas as a backup. So it's kind of the best of both worlds, and usually has an outdoor temperature sensor involved with that. And they usually cost five to eight hundred dollars more to install, but they're well worth it. If you run propane, I don't know how many of you are on propane, but it's so expensive for propane. So either a heat pump or a dual fuel heat pump is a really good option if you're on propane. And don't let the contractor convince you to go back with your 80% old metal blue vented furnaces instead of going with 90%. Um, they're just much safer um, to operate and a lot more efficient. Um, and just one last thing about safety is if you have gas furnaces or water heaters in your house, as you tighten up your house, it can make those appliances even more dangerous. So it's really good um, to actually have an energy audit that someone does a lot of combustion testing. Um, I find high carbon monoxide and flue gases a huge amount of furnaces I go to, or even brand new ones if they're not set right. And, it's amazing how many contractors do not have CO detectors. Um, I think I've only come across one or two HVAC contractors that I even have them and use them. Um, so, you know, that part needs to really change you know, um, the way things work. But if you, especially if you have like water heaters in your house that are the natural draft kind of a metal flue going up through the roof in a closet of your house, even turning on your high power range so can backdraft those. So you just want to be careful as you do all this tightening up. Um, sorry, I was probably all over the place, but I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, Thank you, distinguished panelists. Outstanding as I knew it would be. Thanks. Thank you. So we have, um, we're actually on time. I had to get it the whole time. Uh, but anyway, we have until about 3.30. So we've got almost 20 minutes for questions. So all those questions you've been saving up uh, about weatherization and solar, now's the time to ask. There's a couple of innovations that have happened. Um, first of all, I mean, just frankly, the, the normal capital markets that invest in, in, in helping consumers invest in things like furniture and, and appliances and those kind of things, the, the market, the solar market is starting to gain some traction as a viable way for they, them to, to make money, to do what they do. Um, and, and so we're seeing, for example, companies that you know get, work with furniture stores or, or other types of industries now start to get interested in solar. Um, and in other states, um, one of the big innovations that we're seeing is third-party sales. So there are companies, Solar City is, a, is the most well-known example of a company that has basically aggregated a lot of investor dollars to go out and be able to offer financing packages for their customers, where Solar City actually owns the, um, and there's a number of different model companies that do this. They're the first publicly traded uh, company, and, and we're excited about that because, I mean, again, it, it shows that there's there's innovation and, and that we're starting to make inroads in the in the marketplace. Um, but they put solar panels on your roof. 
and what you pay for, you end up paying, you eliminate your electricity bill and they actually own the panels and then you basically pay them, you lease the, the panels from this third party. Um, there, that's why, as uh, someone mentioned, we can't do this as, uh, mentioned, we can't do that in North Carolina currently because we can only buy electricity from our utilities, as Sally pointed out. Um, that is that is something that I know the legislature is looking at potentially a um, a pilot project, a pilot program to see if third party sales is something that can uh, can can work here in the state of North Carolina. Um, when and if that happens, it will open up a a floodgate of of economic activity in the state. Um, we've been a leader for a long time because we have had, we're the, we were the first um, state in the Southeast to have a renewable and efficiency portfolio standard. Um, we are now number three in the nation for uh, utility scale solar installations and those are the giant solar farms. I mean now if you drive up and down, you know, any of the major highways, you'll see these things. That's a, that, did, that didn't exist, that was impossible um, just five years ago when the renewable energy efficiency renewable and efficiency portfolio standard came into place it created a market for large-scale solar development that has now spawned thousands of jobs in the state um, a flurry of economic activity and, and has really put us on the map even though we are in a regulated state um, so but I'd love to Barrier. So, uh, as an entrepreneur, I'm all about removing barriers, right? So, first of all, let's work with what we've got and work within the systems that we can make work. Help them to, uh, you know, to evolve, and then let's remove barriers. One of the biggest barriers that we have in the state of North Carolina is the fact that each, so our major utilities, um, surprisingly, are, are relatively easy for us to work with because they have standard procedures and processes and interconnection rules. The, the small co-ops where a lot of times people are paying the largest utility bills unfortunately don't have net metering, good net metering rules. So, you know, the places in the state, many of them where we could actually, where the consumers can save the most by investing in solar are the very places um, because of, just because of how they, how they operate. Um, that makes it more difficult. So if we had one innovation in the state of North Carolina, um, I would ask, we want to keep what we've got, don't send a signal to the, to the business community that, you know, we're, we can't, you know, that we're not consistent in our, in our laws and our regulations. And then the other thing is making it consistent interconnection standards across the state because you know, we have to go to, to 100 different little municipalities and, and each one has got a different um, state, you know, set of rules. It, it makes those systems much more expensive. Uh, yes, on the uh, NCC, the, the Sustainability Energy, or Sustainable Energy Association has uh, asked some of the environmental groups to not lobby so hard on the reps because you think you got it in your pocket. Is that really true? Are we going to get it uh, saved? So I will, um, I'll t I'll, I'm not speaking as a board member of, of that organization because I don't think that would be appropriate, but, uh, but I'll speak as a business owner and a member. Um, the bill, when it came out, um, my understanding is referred to multiple committees. Um, there's quite an arduous process that the bill needs to go through in order to be passed. Um, as I mentioned, I mean, like it or not, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of money flowing into solar right now, and money talks. And there's a lot of people who don't want to see, especially the people who are building very, very large scale projects. I mean, there we actually sold the utility scale division of our company because that wasn't all that much fun for us. Um, we actually like to work with customers and, and have relationships with them. But um, but that model is is now a proven model, and you'll see multiple megawatts of projects going up distributed energy across the state. 
There's a lot, there's a tremendous amount of investment that's gone. And, and it's it's not a political, you know, it's not a it's not a, a, a bipartisan, I mean, it's not a partisan issue anymore. And so I think the reason is, that, you know, we really want to send a message that as a business proposition, that, you know, this would make sense. It, it, you know, we all get the environmental benefits. I mean, that's why, you know, I started in this business. I know, you know, that's, we care about these things. Um, that's why we started, but not everybody does. And you know what? It doesn't matter. Honestly, to from my point of view, it, I don't, they can, we have to make, when we can make the business case and we can make it irresistible um, to, no matter what your political, you know, your point of view is on the environment, when we sort of take it beyond that, then we get what we want. And, and yeah, so I think that's where that's coming from. Um, uh, this is a question about, I guess, the details of the LLC. I'm wondering why you don't run afoul of the third party sales uh, rule. If I were to raise money and set up an LLC and sell solar power in my neighborhood, wouldn't I be a third party seller? Um, we are not selling it to the community, we're selling it to the utility. So we, I left that part out, sorry about that. We um, installed the panels and then uh, got interconnected to the grid. So we're, we're connected to the grid through Geek Energy and we're selling, in our case, we're selling all the power that's right now, all the power that's generated to Geek Energy. Um, and then we're also able to sell renewable energy credits to NC Green Power. So those are two more income streams that we have that help with the payback. We get paid by new energy for the power, and we get paid by NC Green Power for the renewable energy credits. But so right now at this moment, none of the power is being used in the common house at Arcadia. Um, when after we, because that way, first of all, it's legal, as you point out, it would be otherwise maybe, but. Um, that way we have maximum payback for the LLC and the payback period can be shorter. And then after the seven years when Arcadia takes over the system, they can make whatever arrangement they want to with Duke. They can, they probably will do something like net metering where they use the power that they can use and any excess power that they uh, can't use at any given time get, goes out onto the grid and any time they need power and if it's not being generated by the panels, they will have power coming in from Duke Energy. So, so at, at this moment, we have what we call a, a buy-all, sell-all system. Arcadia has its own power bill with Duke Energy that it still pays just like it always has. And then we, the LLC, are selling all the power we generate to Duke Energy. Does that answer the question? Not as a revenue stream is not, uh, and, and, and years past, net, the NC Green Power and um, when one of the ways to make solar more affordable was to, to be able to sell these renewable energy credits at a premium. Now, with the prices coming down so much, what we find, and, and again, for most of our customers, they're choosing net metering um, because the, the additional, you have to, there's a lot of company, you have to set an additional meter to do the buy all sell all model. There's some um, additional um, additional things that you have to take into account. I'm actually it's a great question. I'm not actually sure. You know, I I, I think that your LLC could have done that meter in the. Um, I, 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 I just you're selling to the utility. You're not selling to an individual. I just remembered the other reason we had to do that was. The um, power bill, power bill that exists now is with the homeowners association, whereas the power that's being sold is the LLC, and those are two different entities. And Duke wouldn't let you um, have the bill be in one name and the, 
the power sales, the solar system be owned by another entity. But I, I sort of seem to recall that we were not going to be able to sell renewable energy credits at all if we did net metering. So that, um, yeah, so that the payback is quicker if we just sell it all and get the renewable energy credits. Um, and then we'll be in a position sooner to turn it over to Arcadia and then they probably will set up a net metering. Could uh, one of you talk about the value of solar water heating versus net metering for an individual home versus an LLC and what benefits are for homeowners and the credits that are available? You always say that. So solar thermal is um, still a great option for any type of entity that you, that has a large solar water heating need, so industrial process, for for example, that use a lot of solar, a lot of that need a lot of hot water, um, uh, for on an individual on a home owner basis, if you have a large family, for example, and you use a lot of hot water, or you know what, who knows, you know what the, maybe there's some farming processes. We work with some some small farmers um, who used a lot of hot water. But honestly, now, and, and, and gosh, I'm so glad my husband partner's not here because he, you know, so he's a solar thermal guy, and, and, you know, that's how we got into the solar business years ago. But now PV is becoming so much more competitive, and it has, um, I mean, with a, with a solar thermal, and, and I love solar thermal, I mean, I think it's, it, again, for certain applications, but for the average home or a solar thermal system, you've got pumps now to worry, you know, that, well, not to worry about, but, but it's just a more complex um, piece of equipment on your home. PV is pretty much, I mean, you know, it's electricity, so it's not anything to, to, to laugh at or to not take seriously, but PV, once it's hooked up, I mean, it's, it's maintenance free. Um, and, and solar thermal is, you know, you had, there's not a lot of maintenance, but um, years ago, the cost competitiveness was why a lot of people would choose solar thermal um, because it they, does qualify for the same tax credits that solar, that PV does or, or other renewable energy, geothermal and others. Um, but now, I mean, we, we, we still have some clients that buy solar thermal, but vast majority are, are moving toward PV. So photovoltaics that can be used to power an individual home? Right. Yeah, that generate electricity. I, I, I saw a customer um, downtown just a few minutes ago at the Planet Earth celebration who told me that she is thrilled with her solar system, that she just got her $25 electricity bill. We, yeah, and we, we also do, um, we also do retrofitting of homes and to make them more energy efficient. We have, again, a two-part mission, uh, or two-part of our company, energy efficiency and solar, because coupling those two things together, again, absolutely you want to address the usage. Um, and you can bring, we, we have a client who actually got a negative three on, on a, a hers rating home energy rating system is basically the miles per gallon of your home. We had a client who got a negative three. I mean, that's, it's a, it, a net zero energy home it's it, that's that's the future i mean that's where we're going it's going to be when we get some great battery technology and i know it's right around the corner it's going to change everything this question for mark over here um so uh it's maybe a little bit of a long question but, um where is the funding for the weatherization coming from are you are you getting stimulus money uh funding uh, to do the weatherization and the reason for asking that, uh, our church and some other churches have been working with uh, um, North Carolina, Lake County especially, to get houses ready for weatherization. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a crawl space of dirty or the attic is. Um, what do you do about this? So where does money come from and what, what happens if you, if the house needs work for you for the rest? Um, well, a lot of the work we, have done um, falls kind of in two categories. One is just regular homeowners that just call me and there's no subsidy, um, except for Duke and Progress now have um, some pretty good um, 
rebates for air sealing and insulating your attic. It, again, it, you have their requirements or you have less than R19 and then they have some credits for new HVAC equipment and for duct sealing. Um, you're aware of the, what the uh, stimulus might have um, The requirements aren't really that great uh, for you to get a free weatherization. Are you, are you aware of that? Say that again. Well, the and run by, in, in Wake County, it's run by uh, resources received. Yeah, we're, we're one of the contractors That's in the that the program. Okay. And so, um, to follow up, so th there's probably like three groups of areas we work. So for low income, all across the state, all across the country, there's the weatherization assistance program that people can apply for. and get all the, they, they target all the biggest, fastest paying back things and the house can be done, it, the work can be done for free. Um, then part of the stimulus funding was, there was a whole lot of other grants out there. Our company wrote a grant um, two years ago where our grant was to go into businesses and weatherize them. And these were businesses that were operating out of existing Historic homes. I, I love historic homes. Uh, my background is renovating old houses, and you know, they usually can have a huge benefit from weatherization. But so, and then we've also got work um, in Chapel Hill and Greensboro and Carborough from Better Buildings funding, where um, e each of these grants is structured different. Like in, in Carborough and Chapel Hill. Um, there was no income restrictions, but they would pay a percentage of the audit and they would per pay a percentage of the work depending on how much work you did. It had to meet a certain savings level. In Greensboro, they split the program in two where there's incentive homes that were kind of like the Chapel Hill Wise program did where they'll pay like half towards the weatherization for a lot of this work. And, almost the, co the whole cost of the energy audit. I wish more counties were able to do that. Um, and then they also had a part that was strictly grant, everything was free to the homeowner um, based on their income levels. All this funding is pretty much ending. Um, the WISE program has ended. Greensboro has got an extension through September. Um, the weatherization assistance programs are in great need of their funding is going to go like even lower than it was before the stimulus funding and Yeah, the, the Wake County. Yeah, so if you know anybody, spread the word. <laughs> but, um, Sounds like you guys should talk. <laughs> there, there's, it, Wake County's kind of, um, they all run it a little different. Some like Orange and Chatham, it's all in-house. It's a private thing and they don't sub any of it out. We're fortunate to be one of the subcontractors in Wake County. I think Durham does it all in house or mostly not. It just structured different throughout the state, but I'm not, I'm not an expert on their funding though. Thank you. Final question. While we're while we're wish that the the Um, <clears throat> I would love to see a requirement that all homes be net zero energy and, and, and actually contribute, but I don't think that's going to happen. I don't see it happening in the state of North Carolina. And, but here's 
as far as something being legislated. I, I just, I don't, my personal belief is that is a, that's a tough way to, to get, you know, anything to, to really stick because it's, it's, it's it's fungible as we can see i mean so we got the renewable efficiency portfolio standard and now that's under attack um even though really key point it's been wildly successful i mean it's it's done exactly what it was supposed to do i mean it's it's created a market for solar in the state of north carolina we're now number three in the nation um so um i again i am an entrepreneur i i choose i believe that you know you know, and I get in kind of trouble for saying stuff like this, but oh well. Um, I believe that business got us into this mess and I believe business can get us out. So I believe that when it makes more sense, when, when we're focused on creating solutions that make more sense for the consumer. And when the consumer, you know, yes, we have to remove some of these other barriers that, that, that prevent right now you know, really an open marketplace and open market development. But the, but the reality is, I mean, even, even our largest utilities, I mean, they have peak demand problems that, that solar, for example, can help with tremendously. I mean, they have peak demand problems that, you know, we, we can help improve their financial returns too. So there are win-wins out there. You know, it's not a it's not a us versus them kind of thing. It doesn't have to be. You know, we sit down and we have rational conversations about what are the end goals that we're trying to reach. I, I believe there's a lot of common ground. I, I, I certainly in the current legislature there are some some very um, there are some very strong leaders who are stepping up on both sides of the aisle who believe in the potential for the state of North Carolina. I, my representative here in Wake County, Tom Murray, is one. Uh, Ruth Samuelson in Charlotte, I mean, these guys are, you know, they're, they're stepping up and, and it's not, and they're, they're leading Republicans. I mean, this is not, you know, and us versus them. This is, this is something that we need to do for the, for the greater good of our state. And, you know, again, as I said, business, I believe we have, a responsibility and an opportunity to, to help lead the way. And I, I would, we'll put out one small plug um, if anybody's interested in this. One of the things that our company is experimenting with right now is a referral program. So we, it costs us a lot of money to get a client, right? I mean, all different types of marketing things. So we're working with a referral program that either if, if an individual refers someone to us, we will pay either $250 to that individual or we will make a um, donation to a charity in that person's name. So it, it's a brand new program. It's on our Facebook page though. I mean, if anybody's interested in that and if any organizations are interested in, you know, partnering and, and figuring out, you know, how we might figure out something that would be mutually beneficial again, those win-wins or where we believe the greatest opportunity is. But thank you for the question. Before we